Dr. Parker, welcome to the Second Floor Podcast. What's happening, you guys? It's uh, honestly a great honor to meet you. Uh, my name is Ovi. I'm a special special uh, guest host here on the Second Floor Podcast. We've got a long, long time uh, host for, for a couple of years now. We've got Cassius here right beside me. Yeah. Um, after the after the many hours of watching your videos while I was supposed to be studying for the MCAT, procrastinating, I guess. Um, and that may have something to do with the fact that I didn't didn't get the score that I wanted, but let's talk about that another time. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great honor to, to finally meet you, so welcome. Okay, thank you guys for having me. Dr. Parker, what? again, thank you for joining us. I'm just going to shoot it off with the first question. Um, we're obviously in uh, pretty serious times right now with... Uh, with COVID-19, um, a lot of stuff is happening. So my first question to you, Dr. Parker, is uh, given the amount of data and observations that are coming out constantly about infection rates, r not values, mortality rates, rates of people that are uh, asymptomatic, that can be overwhelming for, for any person that, uh, that is trying to absorb all of that information. From your perspective as a physician and as a surgeon, um, how would you say is best to go about kind of uh, handling all that information without kind of really getting to a head and overwhelming you? Yeah, I think I think the you know first of all, I think that we are not going to know the real numbers probably for a few years. Uh, so if you think about it like that, then when you have all these changing numbers and the CDC changes their guidelines and recommendations every couple of months or whatever it is. Um, then you can kind of put it more in, into perspective. Um, I don't, I, because if you go by everything, it's changing all the time and you're going to be scattered all over the place in what you're doing and how you're feeling and all that stuff. And I think yeah. if you say, okay, we're probably not going to know the real story for a couple of years. Once we look back on everything. <clears throat> and so if, if I put my mindset in, in that way, and then I say, okay, so what should I do? And then I think you have to balance for yourself what your risk is for the virus, and then what your risk is uh, if you were to never go outside and not do anything and stop going to work and stop your businesses and, or whatever situation you're in. So I, I think that that's the main uh, kind of way. I, that's the way that I look at it. Um, personally, I'm not a, at a high risk for it. Uh, I'm fairly healthy, sort of young on the younger side when we talk about medicine. And um, although I'm a higher risk because I'm in, in the hospital, baby, um, I, don't, I, I don't think that's for myself, it's a, it's a problem for me going out and meeting people and, and, you know, kind of doing most of the normal things. Now I, I don't want to, you know, infect somebody else if I'm like a silent carrier or something like that. And so maybe older people I'm, or immunocompromised people I'm more careful with or something like that. So that's kind of how I look at it. If you're somebody that's older, or immunocompromised and you're retired, then maybe it's not a great idea to go, rub elbows with everybody uh right now until we know and we could it could be just like su being super cautious and we could get to a point where we go oh wow this is uh this virus is actually not causing these problems that we thought i mean whatever or it's causing way more problems than than we thought it was it w was even reported so i i think that it's personal kind of thing right now weigh weighing your risk of each of those things yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think uh, the way you said it, that it's you really have to weigh kind of what your personal risk is of of uh, getting affected by the virus versus versus not doing anything, just being locked inside and not going to work, not exercising. I think that's uh, very well said. They really have to weigh out the pros and cons. We're here in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, and actually just last Friday, all the well, not all of them, but number of restaurants and gyms and movie theaters started opening. Uh, you guys in the U.S., I think that happened way sooner for you guys. Um, but yeah, we're seeing people just really starting to get out there. We're actually out of, I'm sure you guys have the same problem in the U.S. as well, but virtually every store here, unless you're willing to spay, spend 2000 bucks for a bike, you're just shit out of luck. Like, Oh yeah, yeah. 
because because it's like everybody's going to get everything right now sold out yeah 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 i i think you know the danger of well i i so what i saw happen basically is you you have this like we thought was a deadly virus with a very high infection rate so then you're like okay well everybody needs to shut down uh which I thought was appropriate. New York kind of didn't shut down, and that's why they had really bad. Like they shut down like a week later than everybody else, and they're, you know, probably the most densely populated in the United States. So that's why they had that big problem. But I think at the beginning, you you don't know the numbers. You should err on the side of caution, being cautious. Um, and now we kind of know it's probably not the case that the number one, it's not that as deadly as we thought. Number two. Uh, we know that there's probably a lot of um, silent carriers or asymptomatic carriers and things like that. So that's a it's a whole different ball game, really. But after after you get those this data we've had the last few months, then you can say, okay, well, um, you know, appropriately probably shut everything down. But now many people are not at a, at risk, um, and so th- if you shut keep everything shut down then those people are at risk of losing their jobs and losing, you know, their family and like going into poverty or, you know, you know, poverty, you know, crime and drugs and everything kind of follows poverty. So if you have all these people like out of work, you know, what happens to them? They get foreclosed on like, you know, some of the things I I think about are like, what if, what if a, a 30 to 40 year old parents have some kids that are, 10 years old and they lose their jobs and they, you know, then like maybe have to sell their house or they get foreclosed on or whatever it is, they move those kids into a different neighborhood or a different, you know, life situation. And so instead of having more opportunity with education and stuff, they have less, like that's a big deal for that kid's entire life. You know, it's not just a little like six months here or whatever, like you're affecting, especially children, not with the virus so much, but with businesses and, and economy and poverty, like he may be infect, affecting that kid for the rest of his life. So I think those are kind of things that we definitely should think about when we're weighing the risk. And a lot of people are like, oh, you're, you know, people are stupid for going back to work right now and opening up economy and stuff. But it's very, um, it's a high risk problem to, to keep the economies closed. And I think you'd probably kill more people with that than you would with just the virus, like as the virus, as we know it today, like the virus, as we knew it before, when it first started, we we're like, Oh, it's a really high risk thing. Like it's deadly, blah, blah, blah. That's reasonable. But I think as we get more data, you realize that keeping, keeping everything closed is a higher risk for people than, uh, than opening it with precautions. Absolutely. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I have a more to your point. I have a little brother as well, and I can see he admits it to me. He's 11 years old, and he admits it to me. He says, "I'm just so bored every day at home." He spends two hours of two hours uh, on uh, Zoom or Google Hangouts, whatever they use with his classmates. But other than that, it's just like just isolation. And for an 11 year old, that can be, like you said, detrimental not just now, but for his development down the line. Yep. Psycho- psychologically for a lot of people even i mean myself i'm like god when is this over man i just want to like get back to normal life and stuff i i i kind of i took it very very seriously at the beginning i just stayed in all the time unless i i went to work obviously and um but and even now i'm kind of like still dragging you know and and i didn't really have you know that much to be uh, depressed about, but I'm kind of like, oh God, um, what do I get to go back and just hang out with people and have social interaction like it used to be and stuff like that. So I think it's definitely, those can have long-term effects. You know, I think a lot of the stuff I, I have read about is I'm very convinced that, you know, people, we develop specific, you know, neural pathways and those pathways determine a lot of the things that we do. Um, and so it's like studying is one of them. If you can develop a neural pathway that, that your brain is happy studying for eight hours a day, 
like that's completely different than being miserable studying eight hours a day, right? Well, if you if, if you have everybody isolated for six or eight months or 12 months, you develop these neural pathways, which are kind of negative because people like to be social. And that could that can go on for a lifetime if you let it, if you don't recognize it, that all of a sudden, like you have a negative, you know, way of thinking about things or you're, you're depressed because you're isolated, that you can continue that. And uh, if, if you don't recognize it and kind of like take steps to, to, to correct that pathway can just, you know, our brains just go, you know, once they get something, they just keep going with it. So absolutely. Yeah. I think if you don't recognize that pattern that you're really not trying anymore to be more social and just just follow that path of just being isolated. Um, of course, being respectful of, of the regulations. That's, I mean, that's, that's a given we have to be, we have to respect all the re regulations, but I think, uh, yeah, you really have to try to put yourself out of that, uh, the zone where you go on that, go down that track to just isolate yourself from everybody and everything. Yeah. Do you think, um, Dr. Parker, do you think that we'll get to any sort of, uh, normal normality? down the road and you know in your in your opinion how long that would be yeah i do i think it's going to be uh probably a year or or more from when it all started i guess i don't a lot of people are saying oh we have to wait for the vaccine i think that's foolish um first of all you know i mean influenza vaccines you know, work and don't work and all that stuff. And um, we don't know what, if this thing is going to work or not. We don't know when it's going to come. But usually take these things usually take a really, really long time. I, yes, they're trying to fast track it and all that stuff. But I, I think holding your breath, waiting for a vaccine is just you're setting yourself up for failure. So um, I, I wouldn't necessarily put it on that timeline, but um, I would think it would be more than a year from when it starts. I, I think we have to go through the, you know, the fall and the winter and see what happens. We have to go through this time where everybody's getting back out there and see if it resurges. We have another problem. I think people will be paranoid if, if it does. Uh, it probably will, but, you know, I don't know if it's going to be significant. That's, that's the whole question. I think a lot of people talk about, well, it's going to resurge and it's, we're going to have this disaster. But we still don't know if the virus is is really that significant impacts people significantly. Like in medicine, we talk of we have lots of data in medicine, and and but we you have to you have to figure out what is the noise and what is the signal in that, right? And I I think I talked about that before on a YouTube channel, but uh, you have to say like okay, well, everybody's get like this really high rate of infection, right? Okay, but what is it doing to people? Like, is it, an, is it a significant impact on these people on a significant amount of them? So like initially we basically thought it was, but now we're not sure. And it's certainly a significant impact on some people, but we don't know exactly how many people that is right now. So... I, I think I pr my guess is it's going to come back and it's going to like resurge in large numbers, but then we're going to fight because we just like the, the U S isn't testing kind of how other countries are test like Germany. I think in South Korea, they have the lowest mortality. Right. But the reason is because they've tested almost everyone. Whereas the United States, if you go to a hospital right now and say, I would like to be tested, they say, no, thank you. Go home and uh, self quarantine. So we have no idea, really. This is why I say we're not going to know for a few years, uh, in, in my opinion, of how what the numbers really are, because the hospitals and things they don't, especially the private hospitals, but you know even the the kind of like you know university hospitals and things they don't want to fund uh, this testing because it is it does cost money, you know, it costs them money and and it's really not helping them for, for like an outpatient person. Like I come to the ER, get tested and go home. That doesn't help them at all. Um, so I, I, I see that a lot. So um, yeah, I think, I just don't know the significance it's going to be 
uh, when it resurges. My guess is it's not quite as significant as we think um, or as we originally thought, but it is for some people. So it's a, it's a difficult, you know, thing, but that's, that's like everybody that, that's like any disease process. It's significant for some people and significant and not significant for others. Yeah. Some, some people are really getting the hard end of this, but I think you're right. There's just so much information and so much data that it might take a while, a few years, maybe, like you said, to really figure out what is happening right now. We only know that down the future. Um, now, Dr. Parker, moving on from COVID, uh, I want to focus on medicine, um, the, the studying and the, the practice of kind of the process of becoming a doctor more. Um, so in one of your videos, or maybe more than one, more than one of them, you mentioned that you're already set on surgery. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you mentioned that you're already set on surgery from basically the beginning of when you started medical school. And obviously you achieve this goal successfully. Can you comment on the balance between staying on track? So staying on setting a goal at the beginning. So for example, in your case, at the beginning of medical, medical school, say I'm going to be a surgeon, the balance between that and kind of being more open to letting that path change a little bit, maybe with given circum uh, changing circumstances. So maybe saying, okay, maybe surgery, surgery is not going to, not such a good choice. Maybe I should, I should go with uh, internal med instead. So how, how did that uh, kind of, how was that mindset for you from the beginning? Yeah, well, you know, like, it, it, that's true. For me, I just wanted to go into surgery. I didn't know what kind of surgery, though. Uh, so that did change for me. Um, initially, I was like, I want to do reconstructive surgery, plastics type of stuff. And then when I, um, is mostly I got changed from mentors uh, that that taught me and they were like, plastic surgery is bullshit, you know, kind of thing. And uh, you got, you should do, you know, you should do trauma, emergency. This is real surgery. You're really helping people. That other stuff is fake, uh, fake surgery. So, um, so I, I kind of got changed with that. And I, I think you do have to be open. Um, it's probably a good idea to have an understanding of the, di the different lives and the, the different practices of medicine in medicine and surgery. So first, I, I just, when people ask me, what should I do? I say, first you pick, are you, a, are you a doer or a thinker kind of thing, right? So medicine to me is a lot of thinking um, and also a lot, a lot more patient interaction, I think. And then surgery is a lot more what I call doing. Now, is it, is it no thinking or is it, does medicine, like this question a lot, does, do the medicine doctors just hand me somebody that has a surgical problem and then I go and I don't talk to them and I do surgery and I hand them back? No, that's not quite the case. But um, I think that there are those, those sides, the one's thinker and the one's a doer in surgery. We do, the surgeon always has the kind of last say and who's, you know, if the patient's going to get an operation or what, what operation they're going to get. Um, uh, so we just don't get handed patients. We so, sort of do like some, with simple things like appendicitis and uh, cholecystitis. We usually get, hey, I, I'm pretty sure this is appendicitis. And then the surgeon basically verifies and that, yes, I believe that's true. And then I'm going to do the surgery. And sometimes you say, well, I, d I don't agree with you guys. I don't think it's appendicitis. And I'm going to do this instead. We're going to wait or we're going to try try this first and blah, blah, blah. And then if that fails, then we're going to do operation. So, so it's a little bit a little bit of both. But those are the two big ones. And then once you have those down, like where you, where you fall in that one, um, then it's more like what, what type of patients you want to treat? Like, who are they? What's their demographic? I like old people. I like, you know, kids. I like, uh, whatever it is. I like athletes. I, I like, you know, maybe obese patient problems or something like that. Right. So what kind of patient and then what systems maybe you like, Oh, I really liked, I enjoyed cardiology. I enjoy enjoy GI or whatever. So then you can take each one of those things, even whether it's medicine or surgery and kind of fit those in there and say, um, they well, I liked, I liked the physiology of the heart and maybe I want to go into cardiothoracic surgery because I like, I want to do surgery and I specifically like the heart and I like treating these types of problems. So, or these patients. So that's kind of how I look at it. Um, and you may change, um, I mean, you know, 
obviously you may change and you should be open to changing, but I would try to at least have those um, in your mind before you go in and be looking for what are the systems I like, what, what are the patient, who are the patients I like, um, also where I want to practice. That's uh, kind of, it's not always that easy as uh, depends on this, what you do. So if you're doing family medicine or pediatrics, like you can pretty much get a job or go into any location. But if you're gonna do cardiothoracic surgery or nurse surgery, you can't actually go to um, any location that you want. So you have to figure out, you know, who is, you know, where is it like lacking in cardiothoracic surgery? What are the locations or uh, uh, things like that? So those make a difference. I had a, I had a friend do cardiothoracic. He did, he did two years of internal medicine then he switched to surgery and did five years of general surgery. He did two years of cardiothoracic surgery and then could, couldn't really get a job. Wow. And he, and, and this was probably like around 2012. Um, cause there just was too, not really too many. It's just, a, it's a very small, uh, group of people. And so he ended up doing, and he went to UPenn for his fellowship. And then he ended up doing, uh, transplant, uh, cardiac transplant surgery. So that way he could like end up getting a job after that. So it, it's not quite as simple. I think one of the things that you realize is when you finish, you, you, you're like, oh, I can't really get a job. Just like, I can't just like go to UCLA and apply as a general surgeon and be like, I want to get a job here and just apply. Cause they're like, no, we kind of have everybody. And for the next like 10 years, you know, we're taking the people that we know um, that are from our fellowships or whatever like that too. So, um, you know, where, where, where can you get a residency where you can show off and, people could like you and then they maybe hire you after. So those are also some things to think about. Yeah, that's honestly, it's really helpful for me. And I, I think for a lot of uh, med students out there watching and pre-med students, uh, I even told some of my colleagues from, um, from uh, as I told you, I'm attending, I'm a first year St. George's University student. I said, I'm interviewing Dr. Buck Parker today. Some of them like they lost their mind. Dr. Buck Parker, that's so cool. <laughs> Cause I guess they're in the same boat. They're just watching your videos, learning. Um, so myself, when I started uh, med school, I was kind of had my mindset on psychiatry, but I think now as I learned more about the details of all the systems in our body, I kind of narrowed it down to surgery and between general surgery and internal, some kind of internal med, I know that's still very broad, but when I talk to, for example, faculty about this problem of, uh, I don't know what kind of doctor, doctor I want to be, can you give me some advice? Virtually the most classic or most cliche, most cliche advice is you really, you really feel that when you do the clinical rotations, would you say that that's the case? Do you really feel it out when you get to practice with all those different kinds of patients and realize, okay, that's the kind of patient that I want to take care of? Yeah. I mean, you do, you do get a much better understanding for, uh, kind of like what, what I was talking about, the life of, of that doc, that type of doctor. I think one, one thing I really didn't mention was the lifestyle, right? You want, I, I, I think I went into it saying, well, I just want to do whatever's good for me. I don't care about the lifestyle. I'll, I'll figure that out later. But if you look at sur you know, general surgeons, they all have a pretty similar lifestyle as in when do they get to work? How many days do they, uh, how many days a week do they take call? How many days a week do they take clinic? How much, you know, how many days a week do they operate? Uh, plastic surgeons are very similar. Vascular surgeons have their own, you know, kind of schedule. And so if I would pay attention to those things also when you're in rotations, medicine is, is very different. And so, um, you know, neurosurgery, I, I had a chance to do neurosurgery, but I was like, I, they work even, you know, more than I want to work, I think. So uh, those are also important because it's weird. We spend so much time getting to, you know, the point where we can finish and graduate and be on our own. Um, but then a few years later, you, you're just like, well, this is still a job, right? This is still a job. I still have to deal with the hours 
or my boss or my partners or whatever. And so you want to make sure that you're going to be happy in that, um, in whatever you're doing also. Um, it's, it's a good idea to pay attention to the people that are doing the job that you want to do to see if they're happy <laughs> with themselves. Not some people are just not happy with no matter what, but if you find a reasonable person and they're doing that job and they're miserable, you maybe think twice about that. Um, and if you, if you find that everybody in some specialty is really happy and you like that specialty and they, it fits in everything else, then I would weight that one higher, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think in one of your most general surgeons are miserable, by the way, most general surgeons, just, just most general surgeons. Yeah. I wouldn't say you're miserable though. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, but I'm a very, I'm an exception to the rule. Yeah. Uh, that's actually going to be one of my, one of my latter questions, which is that, uh, you seem like during the interview, but in virtually all of your videos, um, you seem pretty upbeat and high energy. So my question to you is, if I were to pull 10 of your friends, would they say that that's exactly how you are in, in situations with them as well? And furthermore, what would you say is the kind of the benefit of having this high energy in the practice of medicine? Well, I, I, would, hope, I would hope that they would say that. I, they probably would tell you that I use more profanity uh, off of YouTube than I do on, but... Uh, otherwise, I, you know, um, it's, it's not like, uh, it just doesn't come natural. I, I don't, well, it, it, I was really not doing well during residency and stuff. I think residency is very hard. And so I think pretty much everybody is depressed in, in, in our, in our, my program, like everybody went through depression at some point. Uh, so it was really more of a, an effort for me to pull myself out of that. And I, I, that's where I kind of learned all of our neural pathways and how our brains work. And if we get on one track, like we can stick on that. Right. So I was kind of like really feeling bad. And then I figured that out. And so I, I just had to change my brain after that and to look at the world different and just say, okay, like, I'm just going to think about positive things and be positive and try to move the negative things out of my life and try to, you know, not think negatively and things like that. So, um, I don't think everybody understands that they can do that. And that's where I, I do think that a lot of general surgeons, um, just think have this negative, like mindset. Anyway, um, I think it doesn't, I don't think it matters if you're a physician or not. Like you can just figure out that you want to be happy and want to be positive and whatever you're going to do, that's going to help you. Um, uh, having having a lot of energy certainly helps, but you, you know that's the same that's the same thing. Like you can decide to eat French fries and pizza and drink Coca Cola uh, two liters of Coca Cola every day and be super tired, or you know you could not. And and so it's, there's a lot of decisions we have to make to to do that. I um, certainly you're your culture and your family or however you grow up or your friends that will affect you a lot. And so it's important to, to pick the right people to be around you. So if they're positive, you're going to be positive. If they're, if they're not, then you're not either. So it's a lot of, I think a lot of goes into it, but it doesn't, it, yeah, it helps, but it just, it helps anybody. It doesn't matter that you're a physician or not. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I mean, yeah. Omid, you're a, you're a, entrepreneur i would say i think that definitely applies to you as well you gotta yeah. have this you gotta bring this energy in virtually everything you, that you, you do. have to i mean just going back to your point just having the right people around you uh you know last couple of years for myself just having the right people and uh i think that attitude just just kind of unconsciously you just have that attitude of the people around you right so um I wanted to kind of get into to your diet, Dr. Parker, because I know I watched pre, just before we went live, I was watching your video on uh, what, how, what surgeons eat uh, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what their diet's like. And I really found that uh, really funny about the coffee and, and the cookies. Um, but what, what is kind of your, you know, you know, week to week or day to day diet? Um, and how do you kind of keep 
um, obviously it's a, is a very important factor to keep, you know, high energy, especially in your field. Um, yeah. you know, kind of what, other than the coffee and the cookies, well, how do you kind of stay on top of, uh, oh, that was, that, that was tr- just a joke, that, yeah. that whole video, but, <laughs> but, um, I, not that I don't, I like cookies, don't, don't get me wrong about that, but for coffees, like, you know, uh, I started drinking coffee in pharmacology when I took pharmacology, I was like, oh, this like does all these positive things for my brain, like while I'm studying it, I'm just, so I started drinking a bit during that and I just, whatever, continued uh, probably because, you know, I built those neural pathways and now I like coffee. But um, I just try, like, I try to stay away from the, um, the simple carbs. And that's, I, for me, that's the biggest thing. And when I go back and I do, and I have simple carbohydrates, I just, I'm so tired. It's, it's crazy. And I'm not even like that, like I did it for a long, I just ate fast food for a long time. And then probably some, somewhere in, in medical school or whatever, we st- I stopped doing that. And, um, and I, I was like, wow, I have, have more energy and I feel better and all that stuff. And then if I would go, go back to do it, I'm just so beaten. I don't, I don't understand how people function just doing that all the time and drinking soda and all that stuff. So the simple carbs are number one. And I just try to keep a higher protein like ratio, like a 50%, you know, of your calories from protein or something like that. I mean, I'm not, I used to be super strict and, uh, for a while I was, you know, calculating everything, but I don't, I don't do that anymore. I just kind of more, um, it's more intuitive now since I've done it for a long time. Um, just stick with, stick with like lean proteins, even, even like, honestly, for me, steak uh, and stuff with the higher fat content is, is fine. Uh, and just the, the simple carbs just kill me. Although I like, I love sugar and, and cookies and stuff like that. I just got to limit it. That's all. Yeah. Maybe I should know this, but simple carbs, simple carbohydrates, like, uh, that's like, so a donut, right? just, yeah, sugars, just anything. So, so complex carbohydrates are things like multi-grain, um, breads and, and things like that. So, um, and, and, and basically if you, the short version is a complex carbohydrate. Think of that as like a, a, a chain link fence, right? You know, the, the chain link things, it's like all these little squares or these little diamonds that are all linked together. Right. And so you, if you have a complex carbohydrate, think as a, a big stack of those or like a, a long fence or something. And for your body to break each chain takes time. Right. And each one of those little things like this, the little squares, you, you break one. So that's a sugar molecule. And then you're able to absorb it. Whereas simple carbohydrates, they're all individual. They're all just sitting there floating by themselves and your body can take them and absorb them really fast. And what that does is spike your blood sugar really high. And then, uh, this is the problem with, uh, like, uh, type two diabetics. So they get these super high spikes in blood sugar, which then spikes their insulin really high. And then they have this, it's, and then, uh, because they have the super high spikes in um, uh, blood sugar, then that affects a lot of their cells because the cells can't handle the, that, you know, higher sugar, but the insulin is actually a growth hormone. And so when you get these really big spikes of insulin, this is what makes people fat that drink like lots of soda and some, uh, like, um, you know, fast food and things like that is that the, the insulin stimulates like growth, right? But because you just took in 4,000 calories in, in hamburgers and French fries and Coke, um, then you're essentially just build fat, right? Cause you're not exercising. You're not using all that stuff. If you're, if you're Michael Phelps and you're burning 12,000 calories a day, uh, by swimming and you're eating 4,000 in this stuff, then it, that's a different story. But most people are not right. Most people are just hanging out either whatever reading or couch potatoing or whatever like that. So, so that's what, uh, a giant problem is, um, uh, personally, I'm not exactly sure why it makes you tired, why, why it makes me tired, but it just wipes me out the energy. I think you just have these spikes in sugar. So these spikes of energy and then, and then a crash, I guess that's essentially what happens is the insulin then removes, uh, the, the, uh, sugar from this, from the blood. Uh, and then you don't, you don't have that energy that's circulating for a longer period of time. So if you, if you think of the, the long, lots of chains and it's circulating the, the, your body can keep taking that energy slowly, right? So you have a, 
a more even um, energy instead of these spikes and then crashes and stuff. So. so for somebody that maybe has to maintain that energy throughout the day, maybe like a surgeon or a med student or anybody doing really anything that has to keep that energy going throughout the day, then they should probably Especially do something with a low glycemic so index, hard, right? You know, like you have these big crashes and you're reading, you're like, yeah, yeah. I've been there. I've been like there. not very, not very stimulating when you're just re sitting there reading or looking at. Especially like, when it's histology, over. when you're learning histology. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we're talking about uh, diets. We talked about depression a few minutes ago. I want to kind of delve into the the mental health uh, challenges that uh, ment that uh, healthcare professionals have to have to face. Uh, you mentioned in one of your videos that you took a bite of a pizza somewhere one time and it it tasted so good that it made you realize that you've been depressed for a while or something like that <laughs> but uh that's kind of intro to my question but my question is um and i think it's good that you're talking about things like that because some research shows that over half of uh physicians they find it taboo to speak about about mental health um so mental health problems arise in, uh, in often in high pressure environments. And uh, it's often, especially in healthcare, it's an understated issue. Uh, what would you think that could be some institutional changes that could uh, reduce the, the rates of burnout, the rates of suicide? And maybe what are some individual changes that uh, people within medicine or any field in which they have to face this high pressure? Uh, what could those changes be in your opinion? Yeah. So, um, I think this is a very difficult kind of like thing to manage because, um, you know, you have to train to have high stress in medicine. Like you, you can't make, you can't make the training like just low stress, right. And easy because you're dealing with people, you're dealing with stressful situations, you're dealing with you know, life and death kind of things, not always and not every specialty, but certainly you get plenty of stress and like heavy things that are going on in medicine. Um, and so I, I, you know, say a, like us, let's take my, you know, residency, for example, there's no way you can take out all the stress of that. And, and honestly, I think some people are cut out for it and some people are not right. Uh, not saying that it's not saying that it's right the way that we do it now, um, because I will tell you the the father of surgery residency. Um, oh man, I should know his name. I can't. I, it's blanking on it right now. But anyways, so Johns Hopkins kind of essentially um, formed the surgical residencies, and the guy that was in the in the um, in charge of that uh would make residents you know stay up for two days at a time and blah blah blah, and all this stress and that's kind of like how it's got to where we have it now but the guy did cocaine okay so it doesn't count right like like at that time the guy would stay up for like two three days at a time because he's doing cocaine which is now we expect people just to you know be in these really stressful situations and stay up the whole time and all this other stuff and like shame them if they don't. And so I think there's certainly a lot of room to, to improve the programs. Um, but if there is a lot of information, it is stressful. And so at some point you kind of have to do that. And I think, I think the, the USMLE going to pass fail is actually a little bit sad because People are like, well, they, they don't want us to be stressed. I'm like, well, that's great, but you're going into a profession where that's what you have to learn how to do. And you kind of have to learn how to do, use, you learn how to cope. And so maybe the, instead of making a pass fail is having us learn how to cope with these things and saying, hey, this is your, this is what you got to do. If you don't. All right, Dr. Parker, you're back. We're back. Back. Sorry. No, no need worries. to apologize. You're back. That's all that matters. Um, okay, so we just uh, we touched on mental health. Um, 
I don't know if part of your answer kind of got uh, cut off a little bit. Do you mind oh, yeah. just summarizing what you're saying? Yeah, it's just it's just a really tough thing to balance because you know those 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 are stressful. You're you're preparing for a stressful job, and so you have to learn how to cope at some point. I think the thing that we could do is teach people how to to cope with these stretch, stressful situations a little earlier in you know, either undergrad or medical school or something like that, because you don't want to wait until you're getting, you know, two to three years into residency and then decide this is not something that you want to do. And then, and then try to start over, you know, you, it's better to, to have those tools at the beginning so you can start learning how to use them. Um, so that way you can, you know, cope with tests better. You can cope with residency uh, better, you know, stuff like that. So I, I think that's the, the real answer and not so much like, um, you know, oh, take all the stress out of out of being a doctor or something like that. The residency programs, some of them are really difficult, some of them are not. So the ones that are kind of, you know, maybe malignant or something, uh, then probably a better schedule with those are are better. But you know, when you get when you get out, it's your your patients are relying on you, and there's no real schedule. And you know, if if there's a problem. With, you can't just be like, oh, I'm, t I'm timed out today. Like my 40 hours are up or whatever it is. You know, if there's a real problem. You just got to get up and do it. Uh, it doesn't matter what time. So, um, I, you know, there's sometimes there are constraints because of, you know, manpower. Um, if you're the only, say, surgeon in a small town and you operate it, you operate three days a week and somebody has a, a problem at Saturday night at 2 a.m. Like you're the only guy there that can deal with it, you know. So um, it, there's a lot of different constraints. I think that that are outside of residency than inside of residency. You can make the schedules better and improve everybody's life and residency and stuff like that. But I think it is good for us to, you know, feel the pressure in residency while we're being, you know, mentored by somebody else. So it, instead of not having anything until you get out by yourself and then all of a sudden you can't handle you know or or can't cope or don't don't know how to cope with it stuff like that so i think just getting the tools earlier to cope with stress is is really the best answer for that yeah i really think that stress within the practice of medicine is really inevitable for example you mentioned uh, i mean as you know step one has moved to pass fail but really I think what's happening is that that pressure of the of the of the standardized core that used to be a step one, I think is just going to be step two now. So and uh, right. I, yeah. I don't know if you. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty popular opinion as far as I know it. But uh, I don't know if you agree with me. I think despite how and some people get really the rough end of it, but despite how hard it is, uh, going through these rigorous years of residency, residency, for example, um, it's a, it really makes you kind of learn how to withstand all that pressure later on to be able to wake up to to answer those two a.m. calls to drive to the hospital and do that surgery. Um, as we move on, Doctor Parker, um, in one of your videos, you gave an example of a friend that did residency, who's I think a vascular surgeon and who did residency for nine years, but because his uh, wife is a sweetheart, basically, and was understanding his uh, was understanding of his commitment to medicine, they made it, they were able to, to stay together. So would you say that, I mean, relationships within medicine are obviously possible, that was an example, but how would you say, what is the responsibility of that doctor, of that healthcare professional that is, um, has that rigorous commitment to medicine, what, what is the responsibility of the doctor if he or she still wants to also commit to his significant other? Yeah, I mean, you got, basically with medicine, you got two wives, you know? You got, you got medicine as one wife and then, and then the real wife is the other one and sure. they both need, you know, the appropriate amount of care, otherwise they're gonna leave you, <laughs> you know, both sides. So that, I mean, that's kind of how I look at it. And some people have the capacity to do that. Uh, you certainly need your partner. The partner has to be 
very, 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 very understanding. Um, and kind of like not jealous, right? Because it's like you're spending a lot of time with your other partner, your other wife, whatever. And so that for your first one can't be jealous. Otherwise, you're going to have lots of problems. And they will be jealous. It's just that how much. He's he's not lying about the two wives, man. I never thought about that. <laughs> he's the, he's spoken about that on his channel a little bit. But Did he? he? He'd never use that metaphor, but I think it absolutely makes sense. I mean, it's the same thing. Not even just with uh, you know medicine, but even with uh, you know business. You know, your business is your second wife, yeah. and then you know trying to balance the two yeah. is very difficult. And the way he said it, one can get jealous of the other. The 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 physical wife can be jealous of your <laughs> commitment to your business or whatever you're doing. No, totally. But if you don't attend to your business or whatever you're doing, then that will get jealous because you're spending too much time with your. That's that's exactly. Makes it. a lot of sense, eh? Yeah, you gotta you gotta feed the relationships, but I mean, when you build a business or even when you're in you know in a certain industry and you're putting so much time and effort, it's tough to to not you know put that as priority. You know what I mean? So honestly, I enjoyed the conversation so Absolutely, far. Absolutely, me too. I right. learned a lot. Yeah. Um, just as just as an aside, Buck Parker. That's just such a cool name. It is. It is Buck Parker. That's yeah. that's a dope name. Yeah, it's been awesome. Just uh, just uh, getting to know him, picking his brain. For me, it's a pretty cool experience because, like I said at the beginning of the interview, for like years ago, I would be studying for the MCAT or whatever, and. And uh, as a break, I would just log on to YouTube and watch his videos. And now actually getting to talk to the, to the guy. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah. But nonetheless, we got some good time with Dr. Parker here. Yeah. I learned a lot. Ovi, my man. You're not in medicine, but I think you learned a lot. I did, man. I there loved it. Go. Yeah. Thank you, Ovi, for coming on. I don't know, Dr. Parker, if you're on, but uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, yeah. It's been great talking to you. Apologize for this um, technical mess. Yeah, but uh, looking forward to um, to being touching in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I just want to again as a, extend a uh, heartfelt thank you to Dr. Parker for being on and uh, letting us pick his brain for the last hour. Um, and uh, for those who want to tune in to what we just had the past hour and missed it, uh, make sure to check it out youtubecom uh, second floor podcast and on Apple Podcast. Uh, second floor search up 2nd floor uh, and you'll find the episode with Dr. Parker uh, coming out within the next coming days here so again appreciate for everyone who was tuning in thanks to Ovi uh, for being a special uh, co-host here uh, on this live and uh, we'll see you guys next time thank you everybody